Hello, everybody. I pray that all is well with you and yours. Um, today, I'm going to do a, um, a teaching on the end times. This is something that I don't normally che uh, teach. Uh, I don't normally teach anything like this publicly uh, for so many different reasons. I don't teach anything like this publicly. I think, um, I think the gospel of Jesus Christ is too precious and it's too valuable for us to fight and argue over. So I've just learned to just sometimes keep certain things to myself. However, uh, over the last couple of weeks, I've been pressed upon the Lord, begin to really open up this teaching and really teach about the end times and really teach about the last days. Um, are we living in the last days? That's pretty much everyone's question. Everyone is pretty much asking the same question. And they're asking, are we living in the last days? People who have been hearing that their entire lives. Um, I've been hearing it. My grandmother's been saying it. Uh, my great grandmother was saying it. Uh, and for the last 20 years, I've been hearing we're living in the last days. And I'm just kind of, hmm. Okay, so when is the last days? What 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 does the last days look like? It, it, so so today I'm going to really jump into that teaching and I'm going to really teach on what the last days look like. Uh, so before I, I teach on that, I, I have a set of rules that um, I have a set of rules that I want to that I want to establish before I teach that. I have six rules here. Uh, rule number one. Uh, be an observer of the scriptures, not just a reader. Rule number one, be observer of the scripture and not just a reader. N rule number two, uh, this is not to prove anybody wrong. Uh, I'm not teaching this to prove anybody wrong. So let me get it out of the way. Everybody's right and I'm wrong. So we'll just go with that narrative. Uh, so rule number two, this is not uh, to prove anyone wrong. Rule number three. You must have your Bible. Uh, you must have your Bible. Rule number three, you must have your Bible. If you're sitting in front of me without a Bible, you don't have permission to tell me I'm wrong because you don't have no weapons to fight with. Uh, so you must have your Bible with you. Uh, rule number five, hearing the spirit unless you not hear it all. Rule number five, hearing the spirit unless you not hear at all, all right? And rule number six, take everything I'm about to say into prayer. Rule number six, take everything I'm about to say into prayer. Take everything I'm about to say into prayer. All right, let's 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 jump into this because I don't want to, uh, I don't want to belabor the time. Let's jump into this because I'm really, I'm really, really excited to teach this. And I believe that God is going to get the glory out of this. Let's go to Matthew chapter 24 uh, and and I'm going to give you a lot of uh, scripture here. Go to Matthew chapter 24, and I want to really open this up so that we can get we can get some type of clarity about what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. Go to Matthew chapter 24, and I want to start at verse one. I'm going to try to uh, teach teach all of uh, Matthew chapter 24 so that we can kind of get some clarity, kind of get some understanding about us living in the last days, all right? So Matthew chapter 24 is the chapter that everyone kind of go to. It's kind of like the go-to chapter for, for those that, that want to validate the last days. It's kind of like, you know, this is what the Bible says about the last days. Matthew chapter 24. Go to Matthew chapter 24. This is what the Bible says about the last days. So let's go to it and let's open it up and let's bring some clarity to it so that we can stop using this chapter to scare people and so that this chapter can be exactly what Jesus intended for this chapter to be about, all right? So Matthew chapter 24, let's start at verse one because I think this is going to be very important. Context is everything. Uh, context is everything. One of my leaders, he says, context is king. Context is everything. So let's go to Matthew chapter 24, starting at verse 1. I, I wish I can go to chapter 23 and read through 24, but for the sake of time, we'll start uh, at 24 verse 1. And Jesus went out 
and departed from the temple. Man, that is so powerful right there. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. His disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And he said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall be thrown down. So Jesus, the disciples come to Jesus. Jesus, Jesus and the disciples are coming out of a temple. They're coming out of a temple and Jesus looks at the disciples and said, well, disciples actually says to Jesus first. They actually says, do you see how beautiful this temple is. Uh, if you go to the book of Luke, Luke kind of opens this up a little bit more, uh, with more wordy. They said, do you see how beautiful this temple is? And Jesus said, yeah, I, I, I see what you see. However, uh, I'm going to tear this temple down and I'm going to build this temple back up in three days. And you see what you see with your eyes? Now, now notice what Jesus is trying to get the disciples to understand. He's trying to get them to understand the metaphor about the temple. So he says, you see with your eyes, what you are seeing uh, with your eyes, there should not be one stone left here. It should be not one stone built on top of another, right? So then let's go to verse three. Verse three, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, <coughs> privately saying, tell us what shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Now, this is where this chapter is most confused at, all right? Most people confuse this chapter uh, with Jesus' return because of this verse. So let's open this verse up. Let's, let's, let's break this verse open so that we can get some clarity about what he's saying about the last days, all right? Verse 3. And he sat upon the Mount of Olives. The disciples came unto him privately saying, tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming? And in the, in, in the King James Version has the word world, but the original word there is ages, okay? The original Greek word there is ages. So it reads like this. What shall be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Now, this is the thing. There is a difference between the sign of his coming and the end of an age. The reason that this has been so abused is because we have not separated the two. We have made the two one. So we think the sign of his coming is the end of the age. But that's not what it says. Do you notice it's two different things here? It's the word and. And if you and I'm not trying to play with anybody's intelligence, but you know the word and is a conjunction word. So so he so the disciples are saying, what is the sign of your coming? And we want to know when is the end of the age? So they want to know the sign. They want to know something that signifies something that hints to your return. But we also want to know when is the end of an age? This is very, very important. Before I teach the rest of Matthew chapter 24, I, wa I want to dig into the end of an age because one of the problems that we are, we're fighting or we're battling here is that we're confusing his return with the end of an age, which is two different conversations. That's two different things. We're, we're confusing the two. That, that it's not the exact same thing. His return, which Matthew 24 also gives us understanding about, his return is very, very, very different than the end of an age. Let's 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 break down. Let's let's break down. Let's break down the end of the age. Now, now you have to understand um, when the scripture says end of an age in world, they use that word interchangeably. All right. So so where there is supposed to be world. It's supposed to say age and there are certain places that says age that's supposed to be world. So they use that word interchangeably in their translation. All right. They're, 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 they're using it. You know, they're, they're using it as though it's one word in the translation. 
but in the original language, it's two different terms. Okay. Are you, are you getting that? In the original language, it's two different terms. Now check this out. Now, um, it's very important to know that they're two different terms, but I, I want you to see something. And uh, in Galatians chapter one, I'm going to give you an example of it being two different terms. In Galatians chapter one, uh, verse four, it says in, King, in the new King James version, it says it like this. Who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God? And then in the new and, and then in the King James Version, it says it like this. Who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our father? The o original word there is age. New uh, King James put world. So we're, we're, we're attacking the world when we need to attack the age simply because the reason that he came was to put an end to a certain age. So the cross separates two different ages. The cross separates two different times. The cross separate two different days. So there was a last days before. There was a last day now, and there's going to be another set of last days, okay? So let's break it down. The cross separates two different ages. The cross puts an end to the Adam generation, the cross. The cross puts an end to the Adam generation, and the cross starts the Christ generation, which is why Isaiah says, who will declare his generation? Who is his generation? His generation is the generation of Jesus. Who will declare the generation of Jesus? That's what uh, that's what the book of Isaiah talks about. So you you so the cross puts an end. It puts an end to the ages of Adam. It puts an end to the lifespan of Adam. It, and, and I wish I can go deeper in that, but that, that's, that'll take me a whole nother direction. And maybe one day I can teach about uh, the separation of the two generations with Adam and Jesus. Because the Bible calls Jesus the last man and it calls him the last Adam. There's a reason why it calls him the last man and the last Adam. But I don't have time to really go into that. But if you go to 1 Corinthians 15, it kind of breaks that open. Now, let's, let's, understand, let's understand the age, okay? Uh, the age. Now, the Greek word for age is ion. The, okay? The Greek word for age is ion. Right? The Greek word for age is ion. Okay? So what, what does that mean? What is that what does that word mean? It means a period of time when or a period of time with a beginning and an end. So when you see the word age, it means a period of time with a beginning and an end. The age of a, the, the end of an age leads to the beginning of an age. OK, so there are multiple ages. There are multiple ages and age is either the past, present or the future. All right. You get that? The, 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 the age is either the past present or the future. All right. You, 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 you got that. Sometimes the word age is, is not even mistranslated with the world. Sometimes that particular word age there, sometimes it's translated as forever. Sometimes it's translated as never. Sometimes it's translated as course, eternal since the world begun. Okay. So what I want to do what I want to do right quick so that we can have clarity, because I can't fully open up Matthew chapter four to you about the last days. If I don't lay a good foundation for us to stand on, um, most times, most people read out of their understanding and they don't read out of the spirit. So I have to I have to lay a good foundation. So what I want to do is I want to show you the difference between before the ages beginning of ages, this age, age to come, and the end of ages. I'm going to show you these verses in scripture, okay? Because when when you when you really deal when you really deal with the ages, when you when you deal with the ages, what you are dealing with is in every age
age, there are days, okay? In every age, there are days. So when you talk about the beginning of ages, there are days in that age. When you talk about the beginning of age, I mean the before ages, you're talking about a time in those days, all right? When you talk about uh, ages past, you're talking about days in that age. When you talk about age present, which the age that we're in now, you're talking about days in that age, okay? And then when you talk about age to come, days in the age. So are, are you kind of getting, are you kind of getting that? So let's, let's, let's kind of break this down, okay? Let's kind of break it down. So from before ages to the end of ages, I'm going to kind of give you a breakdown. I'm going to kind of give you a breakdown of this uh, in the New Testament so that, so that we can have some clarity, all right? So before ages, uh, Hebrews 1 and 2 says, Has in the last days spoken to us, by his son, whom has appointed heirs of all things, through whom also he made the ages. All right, the King James says the worlds, but this and this is how you also know that the that, that word worlds is really supposed to be ages because it's talking about more than one. Okay, so it says the ages. All right, so uh, Hebrews eleven and three. By faith we understand that the ages were framed. By the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Okay? All right. Uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 2 and 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. So this is before the ages began. So do you see how how Jesus had an entire life before the world began? So I don't want to go too much into that. Uh, so let's go to the second one. Number two. I hope this is helping y'all. Number two. Uh, from the beginning of ages. All right. Number two. From the beginning of ages. Ephesians 3 and 9. And to make all, uh, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages have been, in, have been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. Okay. Colossians 1.26. The mystery which, which has been hidden from the ages, from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. Man, I wish I had time to break that verse down. Uh, Acts 3.21, who heaven must receive until the times of restorations of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began, or ages. Acts 15.18, uh, Acts, uh, uh, let it be known to let it be known to God from eternity, ages are all his works. Luke 1 and 70. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, who have been since the world began, or since the ages began. Alright? So now we understand before ages. Now we understand the beginning of ages. Let's go to number three. Number three. This present age, okay? Let's see what the, what the Bible kind of says about the present, uh, about the present age. Romans 12 and 2. And do not be formed to this world or age, okay? Do not be formed to this world or age. 1 Corinthians 1 20. Where is this wise? Which is the scribes? Where is the disputer of this age? And there's so many more because let me, let me, so you kind of get this age. I'll give you a couple of verses. Let's go to number four because there's so much. I mean, I got, I can teach this literally for the next two hours. Literally. I can literally teach this for the next two hours. Um, uh, number four, ages to come. I'm going to just give you a couple of verses. I mean, I have many of them here, but I'm going to give you a couple of verses. Ages to come. Ephesians 1.21. Uh, far above all principalities and powers and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also that which is to come. You see, that's talking about the age to come, the age to come. All right, Ephesians 2 and 7, that in this age to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Okay, uh, age to come. Hebrews 6 and 5. And he has tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. Luke 18, 30. 
who shall not receive many times more in this present time and in the age to come eternal life. Do you see, do you see that verse? Luke 18 and 30. Who shall not receive many times in this present age? Which means that at the time Jesus was walking the earth, they were in the last days. Before Jesus came on the earth, they were in the last days. All right? Now, in the age to come, eternal life, we are in a last days. Now, there is a difference why every generation says, oh, we're living in the last days. I'm, I'm going to teach it. I'm going to teach it to you. Now, let me talk about the end of ages real quick. Number five. Number five. The end of ages. Matthew, uh, Matthew 13, 39. The enemy who sold, uh, who sold them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age and the reapers are the angels. That's Matthew. Matthew uh, 13, uh, 13, 40. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so will be the end of this age. Notice Jesus is talking about the end of a previous age. All right. All right. Hebrews 9, 26. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Now, listen, he says at the end of ages, hear me. He says at the end of ages, he has appeared to put away sin, which means that when Jesus died on the cross, that was the last days. I, I'm not making this up. I'm giving you Bible. Tonight, I have no opinion for you. If you came over here because you thought I was going to give you an opinion of what I think the last days are, you're grossly disturbed. I have no opinion for you. Look what it says. So when Jesus died on the cross, that was the last days. I'm about to prove it. Um, so a quick summary of what I just said. All right. Uh, uh, just a quick summary of everything that I just said. A quick summary. An age is a period of time with a beginning and an end. At the end of each age, a new age begin. At a certain point in time, people can be in different ages in their understanding and position. When studying any verse of the Bible, it's important to find out what age it speaks of. Okay? God, uh, God's plan shall prevail and each age will carry a much greater grace than the age before it. At the completion of ages, that's where we're getting it confused. Because we're getting the last days confused with his return. But I'm going to break that down. At the completion of ages, all shall be gathered together in Christ. So we shouldn't be hollering, we're living in the last days. Because if you're in Christ, you're in the last day. So you're not in the last days, you're in the last day. I'm about to break that down, all right? Um, and then it's through the angels, which is the messengers of God, who separate the wicked from the just, who are not from who you are, by giving you the message and the pure gospel of all ages. Now, I want to I wanna break something down because go to go to Hebrews chapter one real fast. Because I wanna I wanna help you out because we the reason we keep hearing about the last days is because we're not understanding the ages, okay? And we're not understanding because I, I just read it to you and uh, it was that Hebrews, Hebrews 9 and 26, Hebrews 9 and 26. Uh, I just read it to you. Uh, he then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So Jesus is the last days. Go, go to Hebrews chapter one. I want to show you, I want to show you something in Hebrews, uh, in, in Hebrews chapter one, I think will, uh, I think this will be a blessing to you. Okay. Is this, is, is this kind of helping you all already? Is this kind of giving you all some clarity? Okay. Hebrews chapter one. I want to show this to you. Hebrews chapter one. It says, God, who at 
some versions of the Bible says uh, sundry times. Okay. Um, some versions of the Bible says sundry times, but the original word there is many. So God, who at many times and in many ways spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. All right. So, so, so God many times in past times spoke to the prophets, spoke to the fathers by the prophets, right? So the voice of God, this is really going to be a blessing to y'all. The voice of God will speak to the prophets in order for the fathers to have instructions, right? But look at verse two. Has, look, watch what it says. Has in these last days spoken unto us by his son, who has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Do you see that? Do you see that? So whenever I'm hearing the Bible, according to the prophets and the Old Testament, I'm living in times past. But whenever I hear the spirit through Jesus, I'm in the last days. So being in the last days is having an understanding of the fulfilled prophecy. What is the fulfilled prophecy? The fulfilled prophecy is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. When I receive the message of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, I enter into the last day. It's no longer days. It's okay. I know you, you probably don't think I'm crazy. Go to go go to John real quick. Uh, go to. Uh, I want to go to man. There's so much I want to say to y'all. So much. Oh, go go to John. I'll go to John real quick. I, 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 um. Okay, yeah, we'll go to John and then I'll come back to Hebrews. Go to, go to John real quick because I, I want to I want to show you this so that we can we we can get a we can get an understanding. I want to show you this. Uh, go 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 to go to John chapter eleven. Go to John. Uh, go to John chapter eleven. Man, there's so much I want to show y'all. So much I want to say. Um, so much I want to say. So much I want to show y'all. But. Um, Man, it's going to take up time. All right, John chapter 11, and, and look at verse, uh, verse, for context, let's go up to verse 22, and then I'm going to read down uh, to verse 26. All right, so verse 22, but I know that even now, whatsoever thou would ask of God, God will give it to you. Verse 23, Jesus said unto her, Thou brother shall rise again. Verse 24. Martha says unto him, I know that he shall, listen, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Watch what Jesus says. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, he shall live. You see how Jesus says, you're waiting on a day, but the last days is a person. You're waiting on a calendar day when you need to be entering into a person. That's why Hebrews chapter two says that in times past, God spoke to the prophets. God spoke to the fathers through the prophets. But in the last days, he speaks to the son. Okay, he speaks to the son. So, so Martha is saying, I know I'm going to see my brother again. I know I'm going to see him again at the resurrection in the last day. Jesus says, I am the last day. The last day is not an event. The last day is a person. All right. So he says, the last day is not an event. The last day is a person. I am the resurrection. Now watch, watch what he says. Uh, watch what he says. And um, the, the original 
the, the original clause here, verse 26, and whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believe this. That's what he told her. Believe this. Once you believe in the person you enter into your rapture. <laughs> I hate that word rapture, but I'll just use it because that's something you understand. But one day I'll kind of get on here and I'll kind of teach about uh, what, why that word rapture should not be being used. But I don't want to pick a fight that much tonight. I'm already picking a fight. However, um, uh, so, so, so he says, he says, believe this. So you enter into your rapture when you believe, because what do you do? You are raptured from one age to the next age. You are raptured from times past to the last day. He, go back to Hebrews chapter 11. Go back to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11 and 1. All right, we're back in Hebrews 11 and 1. Back in Hebrews 11 and 1. God, who at many times and in, in many ways spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, has in the last days spoken unto us by his son, who has appointed heirs of all things by whom also are made the world. Now, what is he trying to say to us? If God is now speaking to us, now notice what he says here. He says, who was appointed heir of all things. So what is the son speaking to us about? The son is speaking to us about our inheritance because we are not yet sons. Because we still have an understanding of times past. We don't have an understanding of the last days because we think the last days is a calendar. So you're waiting for Jesus to become wrapped or come and break the sky and rapture us. And that's just not going to happen. You have to enter into him. All right. So watch this. Go to verse six. Uh, go to Hebrews chapter two, verse six. Um, go to Hebrews chapter two, verse six. And it says, but in a certain place testified saying, I'm sorry, but one in a certain place testified saying, what is man that thou art mindful of him or the son of man that thou visitest him? Notice he calls us son. I mean, notice he calls us man and he doesn't call us son. Why? Because there are some who have not come into their inheritance. They have not come into their inheritance by his voice. All right? They have not come into the inheritance. So who is man that God is mindful of them? Because he sends Jesus to pull us out of time's past. All right? He sends Jesus to pull us out of time's past and to pull us into the last day, which is why the Sabbath is not a Saturday. I, I know we think that, but the Sabbath is... God's last day was man's first day. God, okay, let me, let me not go into that. Let me not go into that. Let me stay on track. Now, go, 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 go to verse 10. Go to, go to verse 10. Verse 10 says, uh, chapter 2, uh, verse 10. It says, for it became him for whom are all things and by, or that, that word became right there. That word became right there is it was necessary, okay? For it was necessary for him for whom are all things and by whom are all things and bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. All right? To make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. All right? Now, notice, I'm not giving you none of my opinion. I haven't even gave you what I thought. I'm just reading the Bible because that's very important. The Bible is its own commentary. Now, notice it says to make the, I'm, I'm, I'm about to say something that's really going to make you say, wow. Um, he says to make the captain of their salvation 
perfect. Wait a minute. I thought when I got saved, my salvation was already perfect. What is it that you're pulling me into? What is it that you're, he's pulling you into sonship and then he goes to make you perfect. One more time. He pulling you into sonship. So you go from a man which is in times past. You hear the voice and this voice pulls you into sonship. And this sonship pulls you into the making of making your salvation perfect. Now, this is what I want to tell you that's probably going to make you be like, oh, uh, mm, crazy. We were taught, we were taught that when, when I accept Jesus, my soul is saved. But that's not true. That's not true. We were taught when I accept Jesus, my soul is saved. But that's not true at all. Matter of fact, let me prove it in scripture because I don't want you to call me crass. Uh, go to 1 Peter chapter 1. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1. Remember, he's talking about making our salvation perfect. Making our salvation perfect. Remember, he's talking about making our salvation perfect. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter 1 and 9. I want to show you what it says. I want to show you what it says. 1 Peter 1 and 9. It says, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your soul. So when I first get saved, that is not the salvation of my soul. That is the reconciliation of my life. I know. All right. Matter of fact, I, 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 I got to prove it. Uh, go, go to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verse 8. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 For by grace ye are saved through faith And that not of yourself It is the gift of God Alright It is the gift of God So what is it What is it saying Go to Hebrews uh, uh, Go to Hebrews chapter 12 Go to Hebrews chapter 12 Hebrews chapter 12 Alright So we can understand this Hebrews, he Hebrews chapter 12 and I want to look at uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the glory, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. You see that? So there is a beginning of your faith, which is reconciliation, which means I come back to him. And then there is an end of your faith, which is uh, the salvation of your soul, which is why the scripture says, work out your own soul salvation. Your yes to him was not the salvation of your soul. Your yes to him. What's the reconciliation of your life? All right. All right. All right. So, so, so let's, 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 let's go. Let's go to Matthew chapter 24. I want to, I want to, I want to kind of open up Matthew chapter 24. Okay. Because we, we, we hear, we hear about Matthew chapter 24 all the time. And, and I, I, I always try to, I always try to figure out, uh, I always try to figure out uh, when I read a, when I read a, when I read the Bible, it's hard for me to read it. It's hard for me to read it with um, with with what I was taught because when you build relationship with Jesus, when you start to read the scriptures, stuff look very very different based upon stuff He says to you. Versus stuff you were taught. And then you start to see the Bible a totally different way. All right. So go to Matthew chapter 24. And I want to I want to open this up. Uh, I want to really open this up. Because I, I think that this is going to give so many of you so much joy. And so much liberation. And it's going to help you. 
It's going to help you live life better. Can I, can I just throw a little balloon out there? I, I just want to throw a little balloon and, and maybe I'll come back and pick it up if the Holy Spirit allows for me to come back and pick it up. But I just want to throw a little balloon out there and then maybe you can chew on it and I'll teach it to my mentorship class. But why is it that Jesus died, resurrected, and then went to heaven, but we want to die and go to heaven? You don't want to be resurrected? There is a particular resurrection in you. The scripture talks about your resurrection. And for some reason, we skip over our resurrection and just want to die. And we have used death as a savior to the savior. We use death as a savior to the savior. So I died, now I get to go home and go be with him. When, when that's not really how that is supposed to work. But that's just a balloon I wanna float. I just, um, I, I just wanna float a balloon and, 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 and maybe I'll come back and pick it up or if the Holy Spirit allows for me to it, I will. If not, I'm cool with that too. All right, go to Matthew chapter 24. Let's start back at verse one. Um, let's start back at verse one. That's because we always say we want to be like Jesus. And then everyone says to, to follow the pattern and the teaching of Jesus. But why do we pick and choose the patterns that we want to follow? Why do we, why do we pick and choose how we want to follow him instead of following him in the way he told us to follow him. There, there was a point in scripture where, where Jesus will always say, follow me, follow me, follow me. And he's going to the cross. And it's only one time after crucifixion that Jesus says, follow me. And he says it, uh, he says it to Peter because Peter turns and looks and says, I, I, what about John, the one you love? What, what about John, the one you love? And, and Peter says, what is his salvation to you? You follow me. So we, we just, we just gotta, we just gotta stop and really, and really understand what the scriptures are saying. However, let's go to Matthew chapter 24. And I want to kind of break this open to you and kind of give you some revelation of this chapter and, and give you some clarity and maybe that uh, we, we can all just get along after this, okay? Uh, Matthew chapter 24. Now, this is very, very important. Matthew 24, and Jesus went out and departed from the temple. Uh, his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, see ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, I love Jesus because Jesus is the most genius mind I know. He knows how to give you an eternal parable to any situation. The disciples are just enjoying the temple and Jesus says, yeah, well, whatever. I hear what you're saying. However, you see this temple? It's going to be torn down and it's going to be built back up. So what is Jesus doing? Jesus is kind of like, uh, kind of taking, taking an imagery and showing them something that is about to happen. All right. So notice he's, he's talking about a temple. Notice he's talking about a temple. Let's stay in context. He's not talking about the last days. He's not talking about his return. He's talking about a temple, right? Uh, verse three. And, and the thing about it is, he's, oh man, I'll go back to it. I'll go back to it. I know I won't forget it. And he sat upon the Mount of Olives and the disciples came unto him privately saying, tell us when shall these things be and which shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world. And Jesus answered and said unto them, take heed that no man deceive you. This is very important. This is very important. They want to know about the sign of his return. And they want to know about the end of an age. He doesn't answer that. He says, before I tell you the truth, let me tell you about the lie. Okay? 
He says, before I tell you the truth, let me tell you about the lie. It took them 40 years to build the temple. He's talking about tearing the temple down and rebuilding it in three days. And they're like, wait a minute. And instantly they realize he's not talking about this building. Okay. He's not talking about this building. He's talking about another temple. He's talking about tearing down the temple of Adam and building up the temple of God. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? So he's talking about tearing down one temple and building up another temple. Let's go. Let's let's dig into it. Verse four. Verse four. Jesus answered and said unto them, take heed that no man deceive you. Verse five. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. They will say, I am Christ, and deceive many. Verse 6. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. Listen. All those things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. All right? Read it. I want you to read it because what I'm about to say, I don't want y'all to call me crass. I want you to read it. Verse 6, you show here about wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. What is Jesus talking about? Jesus is talking about false teachers and false prophets. Notice he hasn't even talked about the end times yet. He says, I want to deal with a lie. I want to deal with a lie. I want to erase this lie. You're going to hear people talk about here is Christ. Here is Christ. He says, but watch this, y'all. Watch this. He says, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled. Why? Why did he say be not troubled? Why, why did he say be not troubled? Because he never said you will see the wars. He said you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Notice he's talking about, he's talking about false prophets and false teachers claiming to be the Christ. This is stuff that you will hear. He never said you're going to see it, which is why we have come through the Vietnam War, uh, the, the uh, 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 what else? Uh, World War I, uh, World War II. You got a war going on right now. And why hasn't he come yet? Because he's talking about something that you're going to hear. He's not talking about something you're going to see. Not something you're, he says, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. So when he says you will hear of wars, what is he talking about? He says the false teachers, teachers what? Teachers tell you something. So you're going to hear your teachers teach you. So you are going to hear, which is why he says you're going to hear of wars and then rumors of wars. What is the prophecy? Prophecy is a prophetic word that was spoken by a prophet that you can hear from a different source. So prophets get their word from God. God speaks to the prophet. The prophet speaks to the people. The prophetic is a rumor of what God said about your life. So he says you will hear teachers of wars and rumors, false prophets of wars. So you will hear people prophesy stuff to you and you will hear people try to teach stuff to you, but it's not the truth. All right, let's, 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 let's dig into this. Let's be, okay, check this out. Check this out. This is why, first, let me go to something else. Let me, let me, let me go to something else. I'm going to come back to, I'm going to come back to, uh, I'm going to come back to verse six. I'm going to come back to verse six. I ain't done. I, I'm not done with verse six. I'm not done with verse six. Look, look what it says in verse nine. Um, look, look what it says in verse nine. I'm not done with verse six, but jump over to verse nine real quick. Then shall they deliver you up, to, uh, up to be, uh, up to affliction or tribulation. 
The original word there is tribulation. Then you shall be delivered up to tribulation. And they shall kill. Now listen to this, y'all. Listen to this. Then they shall deliver you up to tribulation. Watch this. Listen, listen, listen. And they shall kill you. And you will be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many and, and became and became and because of iniquity. I'm sorry. And because of iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Wait a minute. How am I going to endure if they kill me? I want you to think about that for a second. I want you to think about that for a second. How am I going to endure if they kill me? In verse 9, he says that they shall deliver you over to tribulation. But in verse 13, he says, but if you endure, you shall be saved. I have a question. I have a question. I'm, ju I'm, I'm, I'm just asking questions. I have a question. How can I endure if I'm dead? How can I endure? Because he's not talking about them actually killing you. He's talking about killing the message in you. So they will try to kill the message in you. But if you endure, that's why Revelation 20, uh, Revelation 20 and 4, you, 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 you see, you see those sitting on a throne and they're beheaded. You see those sitting on a throne and they're beheaded, but they're reigning with Christ for a thousand years. Matter of fact, go to Revelation chapter 20, because I don't want y'all to call me a liar. Go to Revelation chapter 20. Uh, somebody tell me how long I've been on here because I can teach for hours. So I got to watch my time. I think I'm coming up on an hour. Uh, Revelation chapter 20. Go to Revelation chapter 20. And I want to, I want to, I want to show you, I want to show you this. Revelation chapter 20, uh, verse, verse four, uh, 52 minutes. Thank you. Uh, Revelation chapter 20, verse four. I want to show this to you. And it says, and I saw and I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshiped the beast, neither his image, neither had deceived or neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they shall live and reign with Christ a thousand years. Now, notice this is talking about those that refuse to allow their message to be stolen from them. So they allowed their brethren to crucify them because they believed the message of Jesus Christ. They preached the message of Jesus Christ and they refused. To allow anything or anybody make them teach, preach, or say anything else. And the Bible says that they are beheaded. Now, wait a minute. What? There's, now, listen. It says their souls are beheaded. Hold on. Let's make this make sense. Why are their souls beheaded? Their souls is beheaded simply because... We understand Ephesians 5 tell us that the head is the man. The head is Christ, right? The head is the husband. The head is the man. The head is the Christ. So what happens? The reason that their souls were beheaded is because they were no longer head of themselves. Jesus is now their head. That's what that's talking about. It's talking about they no longer have a head. Their souls, it's no longer operating in the flesh. It's now operating in the spirit. So now Jesus is their head. So they were beheaded because they stopped moving in the fleshly wisdom, the fleshly prophetic, 
the fleshly world and they started moving in the spirit and Jesus now becomes their head. All right. Are, are, are y'all getting that? Are you are, are you are are you are y'all getting that? Are y'all get all right? So go go back to go back to Matthew chapter 24. Go back back to Matthew chapter. Now hold on, hold on. Stay stay right there. Stay right there. Because I, I want to show you something. Stay stay in Revelation 20 real quick. Because I, I want to show you something that I, I started off telling you. Revelation chapter 20. I, I wanna uh I, I wanna show you something that I started off telling you. Because because people will say People will say the next couple of verses, but they won't say the end of the verse. So, so let me let me let me say this. Notice that they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. This is a vision. I wish I had time to. I, those that are in my mentorship class, I am so glad you're in my mentorship class, so I can teach you the Book of Revelation the way it's supposed to be taught. Uh, I want I want to show you something. I want to show you something. Uh, verse verse four. Uh, um, they reign with Christ for a thousand years. Verse five, but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished, which means that more people came. Watch this. This is the, listen, this is the first resurrection. No, it's right here. I'm in Revelation chapter 20, verse five, verse five. This is the first resurrection. Wait a minute. First resurrection? There's, there, there's another resurrection? Yes, your resurrection. He says, this is the first resurrection. The first resurrection. Your, this is the resurrection of those that hear the message of Jesus Christ and refuse to die not believing. All right, so verse six. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such the second death, note it, the second death has no power. What is the second death? What is, man, okay, I, man, I wish I were in my mentorship class so I, can, so I can really teach this in length the way I want to. I'll leave it alone for right now. Uh, oh man, I wanna teach that so bad. Oh, uh, God, dog, man, this is, I love the book of Revelation, y'all, because the revelation, the reason that you see so much war and violence in the book of Revelation is because these are not natural wars. Uh, these are spiritual wars. This is literally the, the, the spirit of your flesh and the spirit of Christ warring for your soul, warring for your soul. It's a love story, but I don't got time to really get into it. But man, I love this book. All right. Uh, verse 7, this is what I wanted to get to. Verse 7. Verse 7 is really what I wanted to get to. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. See, we love to talk about that. We love to talk about, you know, when the tribulation comes. Uh, we love to talk about when the tribulation comes and then Satan is going to be loosed on the earth. But that's not what he's talking about. Notice he says a thousand years. He's talking about the ages of a time. There was an age before Christ. There was an age of Christ's arrival. There was an age of Christ's death. There is an age of Christ's coming. And then there is our age and then the age to come. Okay? So, so he's talking about he's talking about a different age, which is why he uses a a day is as a thousand years to the Lord. So remember the scripture talks about the day of the Lord. The scripture talks about the day of the Lord. Uh, in your day, uh, in my day, there is a day. So the day is an age. The age is a time. Okay? All right, so check this out. So, 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 so he says, and Satan will be loosed from the prison. But what's going to happen? Look at verse 8. And shall go out, notice, shall go out to deceive the nations. You are here of wars and rumors of wars. Now, what is this war? What are these wars? I'm about to tell you. And he shall go out deceiving the nations, which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gag and Mogag, to gather them together to battle. To battle. What are they battling here? What is Revelation 20 talking about 
What is this battle that Revelation 20 is talking about? This battle that Revelation 20 is talking about is the battle of the, uh, the, the battle of faith, the, uh, the fight of faith, the fight of what you believe versus what you don't believe. Now watch this uh, verse uh, uh, to battle the number whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about the beloved city and fire came down from heaven out of heaven and devoured them. He's the fire. OK, and fire came down out of heaven. And fire came down out of heaven and devoured them. Verse 10. And the devil that deceives them were cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophets are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. All right. So this war. So the devil is deceiving many. So he's behind the war. OK, go go to. Go to Revelation chapter 12. 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 All right. Now, Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. Are y'all getting this? I know this is a lot. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. I love y'all, man. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. All right, let's look at it. Uh, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. What was the war? The war was the word. What are the angels? The angels are messengers. The angels are messengers. So, so the, the angel Michael, the angel Michael comes and fight the messenger angels of the dragon of Satan, who's trying to give you another message other than the message of Jesus Christ. All right, go back to Matthew chapter 24, because I want to try to, I want to try to give you so I want to try to give you more of Matthew chapter 24 before I before I end this. I mean, it's 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 so much, man. It's 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 so much. All right. Matthew chapter 24. All right. So it says uh, it, it, it says uh, Matthew chapter 24, verse six. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. What did Revelation say that the devil does? He deceives. So what is this war? It's the war of words. It's not actual physical war. Okay? So, and he says, do not be troubled. Why? Because you have a word of peace in your spirit. Now, somebody, somebody said to me the other day, they said, well, what about all the tribulation and all of that? What, what about the tribulation? Tribulation is not a time period where you will suffer. We're all going through tribulation. Matter of fact, let me prove it. Uh, Acts chapter 20, verse 23. Acts 2023. 20, because Paul talks about it. Paul talks about how he was constantly in tribulation. Um, uh, Acts 2023. 20, say that the day, uh, say that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city, saying that the bondman's and tribulation abide me. So tribulation is waiting for him everywhere he goes. So if you belong to Christ, tribulation is waiting for you. All right. So um, let me uh, I, I want to get to and, and, and for nation shall rise against nation. We just read that. We just read that in the book of Revelation. Nation shall rise against nation. We read that in the book of Revelation. What is the devil doing? He's deceiving. So nation can rise against nation. All right. Uh, and then it says nation rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. We just seen two kingdoms fight in the book of Revelation over the word, right? So kingdom against kingdom uh, and there should be famine in the land. So y'all think that famine is, 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 is an actual famine. 
But Amos 8 says that, the, oh, 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 that's a good one. Go to Amos chapter 8. Go to Amos 8. Oh, that's a good one. Oh, that's a good one. Oh, that's, that's going to that's gonna really bless y'all. That's going to really bless you. Uh, go to Amos chapter 8, and I want to look at, oh, man, I forgot about that. Uh, go to Amos chapter 8. Uh, oh, man, that's. That's going to be a good one. Uh, Amos chapter 8, verses 11 through 14. Amos chapter 8, uh, verses 11 through 14. It says, it says, behold, the days come. See, see, talking about the last days again. I told you, you're going to love it. Behold, the days come, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land. Not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east. And they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. So there's a famine in the land. Not it does. Pre, people preach this, and they say there's a famine in the land for the word of the Lord. That's not what this says. It says it's a famine in the land for the hearing of the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord doesn't have a shortage. Hear it. There's a shortage of hearers. There's a shortage of hearers. Okay. So go 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 back to so 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 this famine that is talking about. It's talking about the famine of those that will hear the word of the Lord. All right, go back to Matthew chapter 24. I need to wrap this up. Uh, I, I might have to do a part two to this because I know this is a lot. This is a ooh, this is a whole lot. Uh, I, I might have to do it. Uh, um, and pestilence and earthquakes and divers play. Oh, man, I want to break down. I, I want to break down every word. Okay, let me get to where I'm going. And, uh, and, the, and, and these are the beginnings of... Of sorrows. Now notice, if you notice, everything that he's saying here is emotional terms. It's terms that you hear and you feel. It's not actual physical stuff yet. Why? Why? Because he's not talking about his return. <laughs> he's not talking about the, the completion of ages. There is a different return that he's talking about. Um, and, uh, uh, oh man, go to, go to verse 15, go to, uh, oh man, there's so much I want to, just so much I want to give y'all. Uh, okay. Uh, how long have I been on here? Okay. Ver verse 15, uh, ver ver verse 15, verse 15. Now a lady said to me the other day and, uh, and I don't, you know, I'm, Sometimes when people tell me certain stuff because I really know the Bible, I have to pray that I don't become arrogant. So can y'all pray for me about that? I got to pray I don't become arrogant because some of the stuff that people say just don't make sense. So a lady said to me, and she, I, I don't think she knew any better. And if she watching, oh, well, bless you. Uh, so she said to me the other day, she said, well, what about Daniel's? What about Daniel's vision? Daniel had a vision of uh, of the last days and. What about the 70, uh, 70 weeks of Daniel vision? And I, I laughed at the comment. I really did because I thought it was really, really funny because we learn stuff based upon what we heard and we don't learn stuff based upon what we study. Look at, look at, look at uh, uh, chapter 24, verse 15. And, I, and, and I'm going to get ready to wrap this up because I, I know this was a lot. Uh, 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 Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place. Look what it says. Whosoever readeth, let him understand. Do the scripture not constantly say in the book of Revelation? Uh, those that have an ear, let him hear what the spirit of the Lord is saying. Even Paul said, hear what the spirit. So even right here, Jesus is saying, those that readeth, Understand, understand in the spirit. So when you read it, you can understand what he's talking about. Notice he started saying 
in verse one, two, three, he started saying, I'm going to tear down a temple and I'm going to build the temple back up. I'm going to tear down a temple. So what is he saying? The desolation, uh, the abomination of desolation, that the, that the thing that sits in you, the thing that sits in you, this is y'all going to really love it. The thing that sits in you, it's going to become desolate. It's going to be an empty space. There's going to become an emptiness in you. Why? He has to tear down the temple. Everything that's in you, he has to tear it down and he has to build himself up in you. All right? He has to build himself up in you. So what is the greatest mystery? The greatest mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. All right? The greatest mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. But there is another mystery. Second Thessalonians talk about it. Second Thessalonians talk about, I think it's Second Thessalonians 2. Uh, Second Thessalonians talk about uh, the, the mystery of lawlessness. The mystery of lawlessness. Y'all ready for this? Uh, the mystery of lawlessness deals with Adam in you. So it's talking about the man, the man Adam that's in you. I'm coming down to tear down the temple of Adam. Which is why, why Adam's first son brought a sacrifice. Adam's first son brought a sacrifice because Adam was the priest in his own temple. So he's saying, I've got to tear down the temple of Adam and you will no longer be your own priest. I will now be your priest. So I'm going to tear down that temple. So Daniel was talking about tearing down the temple in you so Christ can come and dwell in you. All right. So so Christ can come and dwell in you. Now, remember when Jesus said in John 17, Jesus said in John 17, he says, I was with them in the world. I kept them before your name. And then he says, uh, a matter of fact, let's go to it. John chapter 17, uh, John chapter 17, uh, verse verse 12. Um, be, because Thessalonians talk about the man of perdition. Thessalonians talk about the man of perdition, right? So um, John chapter 17 and uh, verse 12, it says, While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that givest me, uh, those that gave, those that you gave me, I have kept. And none of them are lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Who is the son of perdition? Who's the son of perdition? The son of perdition is Judas. So why is he talking about the mystery? Why is he talking about the desolation? So what was Daniel trying to give us an understanding of? Daniel was trying to give us an understanding of that there is a there, there was going to be a son of perdition in you. The son of perdition is Judas. There is a Judas in you. Judas comes to be an enemy to the resurrection and to the truth and to the righteousness of God. Okay? So there is something in you that wants to be an enemy to the righteousness of God. So he says, and set the son of perdition is revealed. I know this is, this is a lot. This is a lot. All right. So, oh man, there's so much I want to say. So, so I'm going to stop here. Uh, I, I, I want to go on and on, man. There's, it's, there's so many different verses here. Uh, so, okay, real quick, I'll say one more, one more thing, real quick, and then, and then I'll let you go. So, someone has said to me, "What about, what about Daniel's vision?" Well, we can't take Daniel's vision here and make this about the last days. Why? Because Luke 16 and 16. Notice what Luke 16 and 16 says. Luke 16 and 16 says. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached and every man presses into it. So it means everything. John was the last prophet of the Old Testament. I don't know if you knew that or not, but um, John was the last prophet of the Old Testament. Yes, I'll leave this up for about 24 hours so y'all can go back and kind of take notes and all that because I know I kind of talked, I talked extremely fast. So John was... Uh, 
John was the last prophet of the Old Testament. The Old Testament did not end with Malachi. The Old Testament ended at the cross. But I'll leave that alone. I know that's a whole nother revelation. The Old Testament ended at the cross. It didn't end in Malachi. However, Matthew 5 and 17 says, think that I did not come uh, to do away with the law and prophets. I came to fulfill what the law and prophets were talking about. Why? Because the law and prophets were prophesying about a Christ. I came to fulfill what the law and the prophets were talking about, which means they were talking about me. I am the manifestation of their prophecy. That's what he said. He said, I didn't come to do away with the law. I came to fulfill it. I am the manifestation of the prophetic word. So what Daniel was talking about the last days, he saw about Jesus. Now, there is another thing I want to say to you. I know I said I was going to let you go, but uh, just learn so you can become better. All right. Just learn. Uh, or Hebrews chapter 10 verse 1 says, for the law having a shadow of things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continuously make the comers thereon perfect. However, it says in Colossians 2 16 that there was a shadow of things to come and Jesus is the image of the shadow. So everything in the Old Testament was a shadow. Jesus is the image. All right, last thing that I'm going to say, uh, and I'm going to let you go, and maybe I'll come back and teach about his return. Last thing I'm going to say. Uh, how many comings of Jesus are there? Uh, how many comings of Jesus are there? I'm just curious. Uh, I'm just curious to, uh, to know what you all think. Uh, how many comings of Jesus are there? I'm just curious. I want to see how many comings of Jesus are there. Okay. All right. All right. So there's one coming of Jesus. Someone says one. Someone says three. All right. Three. So, I'm glad that y'all are very, very smart. Um, and some of y'all, y'all are in my mentorship class, so y'all are cheating. Amen. But some of you not. There are three comings of Jesus. There are three comings of Jesus. Um, Revelation chapter 1. Um, I'll, I'll go to it real quick. Uh, do y'all know what the three comings of Jesus are? There are three comings of Jesus. Do y'all know what the three comings of Jesus are? <laughs> Bro, that's so funny. Uh, do y'all know what the three comings of Jesus are? All right. So let me uh, let let me tell you what the three comings of Jesus are. Uh, Revelations one and four. Uh, there are three comings of Jesus. Revelations one and four. Uh, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is which was and which is to come. So he was, he is, and he's coming. We already dealt with his was. He came to die. That's was. His second coming is when he comes in us. And I'm going to shut my Bible because I can teach for another 40 minutes on that. So I better, uh, I better shut up. So he who was, is, and is to come. Matter of fact, I don't want to shut my Bible real quick. I want to show y'all something real fast. I know I keep saying that. I want to show y'all something because in Revelation, y'all say something that tickles me in church. And I just, I laugh all day. I laugh all day long. Uh... I laugh all day long when y'all say this because uh, <laughs> one day I'll get on here and teach about was, is, and is to come. And may I teach about the Son of Man. I mean, there's so much I want to teach, but I'm trying not to go into four hours of this. 
But I want to show y'all something real quick that y'all say in church. I think it's really, really funny. Revelation 4 and 8, it says, And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within. And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Y'all say that in church all the time. Oh, the angels go around the throne saying, holy, holy, holy. But that's an incomplete sentence because they're saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Which was and is and is to come. Why do y'all don't say that when you're doing your testimony service? You know, you know, come on, the angels are saying, holy, holy, holy. But wait about it. Wait a minute. What about the is and the, uh, was and is and is to come? What about that part? But we only express our limited capacity of explanation. And I'm not upset with you because most of you need a theology to cope with your complacency. So the reason that we believe some of the stuff that we believe is because we need a theology to cope with our complacency. So, amen. So I really hope that this blessed you. Uh, I really hope that this helps you. I mean, this, this man, I wanted to go so deep. I wanted to, I wanted to really teach the entire book of Revelation, uh, but I didn't ran out of time. So I really don't have the time to do it. But thank you all so much for listening to me and and uh, and allowing me to uh, allowing me to express uh, the heart of God concerning the return. So uh, just a quick recap. Uh, so. The last days is if I'm in Christ. Being in Christ is a day. It's not the last days. I'm in the age of being in Christ. Uh, that is a different conversation from his return. So now the reason that you've always been here and we're in the last days is because they didn't separate the difference between uh, the days and his return, which was two different conversations that somehow we made them to be one conversation and uh, I made none of this up of my own recontinence. I literally studied, read, and I gave you none of my opinion. I gave you all of the word of the Lord. So uh, that is so. Father, I thank you tonight. I thank you tonight that you're absolutely beautiful. You're beautiful in all of your ways. You're majestic in all of your ways. You're awesome in all of your ways. You're powerful in all of your ways. Father, I thank you for a fresh revelation of your word. I thank you for a fresh revelation of your return. I thank you for a fresh revelation of the days we're living in. I thank you for a fresh revelation of everything that you're saying to us in this present moment and in this time. Father, I thank you that these are the days that was prophesied by the prophet Joel. I thank you that you are no longer rending our garments, but you're now rending our hearts. So, Father, we open our hearts up to you and we allow you to come into our hearts. We allow you to descend and we allow you to come and take over our life. Tabernacle our flesh. Father, I'm asking that you be the one that leads, guides us and continue to move us from a place where we was to a place where we are. Father, I thank you that we are no longer in times past, but we are in the last day because we are in you. We are in a new creation. Those that are in Christ are a new creation. So I thank you for making us to be a new creation. I thank you for the newness of life. It's in Jesus' name I pray. It is so. Amen. Uh, <laughs> now I see why you're so blessed and why you're so prosperous. You have the real truth. I love y'all, man. Thank y'all so much for listening to me. And uh, if, if y'all have questions, you can post your questions in the comments and then I'll go through the comments and kind of answer some of the questions that you might have. But I think I pretty much kind of answered every question down to the detail, but maybe you want me to explain something a little bit more, go into something a little bit deeper. So jump into that. Man, if you're not in my mentorship class, you're missing out. You're definitely missing out if you're not a part of my mentorship class, man. This, this semester is about to get crazy. We get deep into this stuff because we want to know the truth. And we don't want to continue to play games. So thank y'all for uh, for loving me, for trusting me, for listening to me, uh, for allowing my mouth to be uh, something that you incline your ear to. I do not take it lightly uh, and I do not take it for granted. All right. I love y'all. Have an amazing day, everybody.